Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining today's CICM webinar. We are joined today by Dennis Baker and Joe Kettner, hosting on behalf of CICM corporate partner Company Watch, who will be taking us through a presentation titled Sorting the Weak from the Strong, Understanding the Credit Situations of Clients. We always welcome questions from the attendees, so if you do have any questions for either Joe or Dennis during the session, please feel free to type them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Without further ado, I'd like to pass you over to Joe and Dennis. Welcome, both. Thank you. Thanks, Becky, and thanks, everybody, for, for joining us today. Um, as Becky said, we're, we're just going to have a, a look today about how to identify um, strong companies and, um, and weak companies, uh, which is obviously very, very important in, this, um, in these uncertain certain times. Um, so the, I think we're, all, we're all very conscious of, of being in a completely unprecedented um, period of uncertainty. There's, even today as we speak, um, you know, all the, the stuff in Parliament is, is, is starting to take a dramatic turn. Um, and and every, every day there seems to be a barrage of negative news stories, um, which is having impact on the decisions that businesses are making or, or in fact, not making. Um, and barely a day goes past without news of another failure, um, in particular the high street and retail um, sectors and construction sectors are having a, a really torrid time. Um, but when we read about the failures being blamed on uncertainty surrounding Brexit, Dennis always gives me a bit of a wry smile. Um, so I'm going to ask Dennis to explain why, why he is, is a little bit uncertain about, um, about Brexit being the source of, of all evil. So yes, so, well, there's no doubt yeah. that uh, the political uncertainty, you know, you know, obviously with Brexit, and the economic uncertainty which has been going on for at least the last 10, 10 years since the downturn in 2008 and 9, which is just sustained all the way through. And there's uh, weaknesses within the retail sector and the construction sector. All of those, of course, play a role. But when you look at the companies that have failed or going through very difficult times, you can see that they've been weak for years. They've been struggling all the way along. And yes, it's taken a final straw which has broken them and they failed. Uh, but it's, this is it's not purely because of the uncertainty of, of Brexit or purely because of the economic downturn. These companies have been weak all the way along. It's probably worth looking at a few if we start with uh, Fly BMI. So this is our, 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 our evaluation of, of uh, Fly BMI. Uh, all companies are evaluated from zero to 100. 100 is the strongest, zero is the weakest. Any company that falls at 25 or below, much like uh, the other agencies, uh, are, are in our warning area and uh, are a potential to failure. If, you, if you're in our warning area, it's about a one in four likelihood of failure. If you're outside the warning area, it's about a 0.2%, so very, very unlikely to fail. It's once you're in the warning area, you're now amongst the group of companies that could potentially fail. Just by the way, the dotted line is companies in the, uh, in the sector, but that's uh, just a, a nice to know line. It's the blue line, which is critical. So Fly BMI have been weak for years, and, and uh, uh, yes, they've failed, and they've, in fact, they, I think... They blamed, didn't they? They said they, they're, they're, um, their reasoning for, for this um, administration, which was uh, February this year, was about the... Um, the future prospects that have been seriously affected by uncertainty created by the Brexit process, um, which has led to our inability to secure flying contracts in Europe um, and lack of confidence around BMI's ability to continue flying between destinations. And if you look at, if you just start to look at the financial data, and really today's session is about financial data, uh, if you look at the, I'm just going to click on the financial data, look at the summary accounts, here's a company whose sales went from 55 million to almost 80 million in the four or five years, so great, great news. Yeah, so the, the top line is excellent, but losses all the way through. I mean, yes, it did come down a little bit, which allowed them to improve slightly, but stayed very, very deep within the warning area throughout. So that's just one example of a company that's brained the political situation, uh, and, and you can't deny that it is a political situation, but this is from a very, very weak a position. A weak starting point. And I think the other, the one we're looking at was pretty, pretty green, which is in the, um, uh, uh, okay. uh, in the news recently. So I think that, that's interesting. That's a Lee and Gallagher-owned um, um, company, isn't it? And they're, they're I, I about. Think, I think maybe. <laughs> <laughs> they're um, they're wonder, about to, to, to tip over. Yeah. So uh, pretty green. I think they're about to fail. They again have been deep in the warning area. They've they've quoted uh, uh, distress times on the high street which of course is true. And if you look here, there's a little interesting uh, uh, 
piece of news article, if you look at the unsecured distressed debtors, their customers, you click there, and you can see that uh, Pretty Green actually just lost 522,000, so half a million pounds on House of Fraser stores. And that, you know, it, a company which, which is already weak to have a knock like that, um, uh, uh, it's quite hard know, to recover from, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and, that's, yeah. and that's the point, isn't it? I think we're um, we're looking at those those companies that are already weak, just the kind of final straw that can tip them over the edge. But you know, on the other hand, you've got companies like uh, Burberry, for example. I mean, the important thing is, you know, every company goes through ups and downs. It's the strong ones that survive, strong ones that survive. It's the weak ones that topple over. And clearly, Pretty Green and uh, uh, and a number of others. Uh, uh, we, we'll look at Paper Chase in a moment. Uh, Fly BMI were weak to start off with. And I, I, we can look, quickly look at, at a last example on this is Paper Chase, uh, which is exceptionally weak. Again, uh, uh, very poor. They've had to close a whole range of stores. And if you look at the financial data, also losses, uh, in, uh, increasing losses in the latest year, and they simply couldn't sustain it. I'll show you, not everyone's weak. Some companies are strong. If you look at a company like Burberry, you know, the high street fashion retailer, they are powerfully strong throughout. And if you look at their share price, their equity price, you can see their share price went up and has been going up and down over the years. So in 2015, they had a value of 1871. And by, uh, uh, by 2000 and early 2016-17, it was 108.9. So a 60% drop in the share price. Then goes up again, then goes down and up again and down because they were the burning some of the... I think the, they were burning stock, weren't they? I think they burnt about £90 million stock, uh, um, and, pounds worth of stock. And gave which... a, a lot of bad press and, and they didn't like it. But uh, Burberry is an exceptionally strong, uh, exceptionally strong company and, and they're going to sustain it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the other one to, to look at um, is, the, um, is, is Greg's, I think, in there. We, um, it's we've got yeah. the, the power of the, the vegan sausage roll again. They've, they've gone through their, um, their ups and downs over the, um, over the year. Let's have a look. Uh, okay. we're, we're struggling, so there we are. Up this. Uh, yeah. So this is Greg's, also exceptionally strong. If you look at the equity profile, in fact, uh, in 2000, April 2018, they issued the fact that their profits were coming right down uh, because of the, at that time, the beast from the east apparently affected people's uh, ability to buy uh, pies. And, the, and uh, the profit warning issued, and the share price came right down. In fact, at that point, we made a statement to say that Greg's is absolutely rock solid and they'll, they'll easily weather the storm, I suppose, literally. Uh, and uh, in fact, the share price is record high. If you go into the financial data, you can see the sales have gone right to the very top, over a billion now, and uh, profits are at a record level. So Greg's is an example, and Burberry, I suppose they different types of companies, are examples of companies that easy, easily weather the storm. You know, Fly BMI, or paper chase have a tough time and the game's over, or have to do major reconstructions. Burberry and, and Greg's have tough times, and they just keep going. Yeah, and they're fine, yeah. 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 So then the question is, I suppose, if we're, if we're, if we're saying that, that strong companies don't fail, but weak companies fail, then it's, uh, but you know, that's, but news like profit, profit kind of bumps don't really tell you the full picture if you're looking at, at companies like Burberry's and, uh, and Greg's. How do you then, Try and separate out these, these strong from the um, from the weak. Now here at Company Watch, we've, we've spent um, years of searching the things that can be used to predict failure. Um, we've looked at payment data, we've looked at country risk, sector issues, quality of management, CCJs, director history, and so on. But really, by far the most powerful indicator is looking at the um, the financials and looking at the fundamental financial um, dynamics of a. Um, of a business, and we'll share with you the drivers um, that our research has, has found to be the most predictive um, indicators. It, it's worth addressing the criticism that's often levelled um, against using account data is that they're out of date, that we're, we're looking at old data. Um, as you all know, private companies have nine months from the, the end of their year to, to file accounts at, at companies' house. So in September 18, at the beginning of September 18, you can still be looking at accounts that were only valid until December 16, because um, you know the, the 17 accounts aren't filed until the end of the month. Um, but but the point is that we we've always in the, in the research we've we've always looked at that at that um, 
the, the same kind of methodology. So we're looking at a company that, that's failed and looked at the, the most recent accounts that are in the public domain and tried to, to identify the, um, the things that were within those accounts that could predict those, those events that happen quite a lot in the future. So what we do is we take a, a, a known event in time, so a company failed in February 2019 or September 2018, we go back into the financials that they proudly published the company's house or on, on their website, and we look and see what was in those financials that could have predicted the failure six months, 12 months, 18 months later. And you don't do that with one or two, you do that with hundreds and thousands. And you're looking for the characteristics that separate the failed companies from those of healthy companies. And that's essentially uh, what, what, what... And of course, if you can get more recent accounts, it's always, it's always great to have more up-to-date information. So, um, we, you know, quite a lot of, of, of people will ask their, their customers for updated management accounts, for example, and, and they always come with a slight health warning that, that perhaps they haven't been audited and they're not prepared on quite the same basis as you would expect. Um, for year-end accounts that are being filed at, at companies' but house. Is, but even so, it's still, worth, it's still worth looking if you can get more. If you are always more up-to-date or fuller, financials are always better. But bear in mind uh, the models, uh, you know, the algorithms are built on historical financials to predict future events. So, we, you know, we, we're all relying on historical information. And frankly, it's extremely predictable. It's very uh, successful in, in predicting and identifying those who are weak and those who are strong. So essentially it comes down to the kind of ratio um, analysis. I'm sure I've just put some on the screen that I'm sure lots of, of you will be familiar with. Um, we, we put hundreds of different ratios into the pot and we, we're working about the, the best ones that, that discriminate the strong from the weak. And we, we came up with seven, um, one looking at the profit side um, of, of the accounts and six on the, on the balance sheet, three on the asset side and three on the, um, the funding side. I think it's important to say that it's, it's, they, it varies, so that the models will, will work out which. Yes, is I mean the point is waiting. Yeah, uh, uh, as Joe says, there's one profit-related ratio and six balance sheet-related ratios, three on the asset side of the balance sheet ratios, and three on the funding side of the, uh, of the balance sheet. And clearly, you can't have the same ratios to evaluate a property company as you do for a, a retailer, and you can't have the retailer that, that's similar ratios to an airline. So you have to have. You have, to, you have to be a little more refined about it and make sure that you're picking up the appropriate uh, um, ratios that separate the strong from the weak, irrespective of the, of the sector that they're in. And it's hard, you know, with the, with the sector, I think, um, again, this, this SIC code is a notoriously unreliable um, way of identifying sector. So again, we've, within the, the model building, we've, we've looked at, at the models themselves picking up um, a sector indication. So we, we tend not to rely on the SIC code as a, as a particularly strong indicator of, um, of the real industry in which the a company yeah. operates. Um, so it, it just have a quick look at this in, um, in practice. We, we've chosen the um, outsourcing sector as a, um, as a good little case study to, to look at this. Um, and I'm sure most of you, again, will, will remember Carillion um, failing last January, um, InterServe as well as just gone, um, gone through administration. Um, events and, and you know the other the whole, the whole sector, whole sector is, in the UK is, is in turmoil really, really. Um, and you know we, we actually look at this as a, almost a bankrupt um, type of business model so we'll have a have a look at the, the, the dynamics and see see how you can you can kind of identify the, the things in the in the accounts that, that that show you that this is something to be to be aware of even if profits are actually looking looking not bad um, so maybe we should start with um with well, well, I was going to so, Dennis, I'll hand over to. I mean, I was going to uh, just uh, just give a little preamble on uh, the outsourcing sector. Uh, we use the, the the phrase bankrupt model, but just to, uh, what's been going on is that, of course, these are companies that have, have uh, often taken over major functions of government uh, activities and projects, uh, and um, include such names as Mighty, Carillion, Interserve, and so on. Um, what's been going on is the the profit margins of most of these companies have been coming down over the years, essentially fighting the same for the same business and presumably under, undercutting each other, and so that the margins have become smaller and smaller and smaller. And every year there, there's, there seems to be a write-off or an exceptional item, such that the exceptional item becomes rather unexceptional. But part of the fabric of the way that yes, uh, and losses every year, 
And uh, on the other hand, if you look at their balance sheets, um, the only way they can grow their companies and, and achieve a little bit of profits is through acquisition. So they tend to make acquisitions of, of other companies and quite aggressively. And, uh, and, and what, what happens is they, they, buy, they find a company that's worth 10 million and they pay 100 million for it. So 90 million goes on the balance sheet as goodwill. And that basically is air. It's just the excess of the money they've paid in order to acquire another company. I'm assuming they, they think they will, they will get the money back from yes. that. Presumably and, that in... and occasionally, and not sorry, you know, in, in many cases when you make an acquisition, it does produce super profits, but clearly not in this sector. Uh, frankly, the profits have been coming down while uh, acquisitions have remained. And I suppose the other thing on, on, the, on these contracts is that it, they tend to be over a long period. They tend to be maybe 10 or 15 years. Um, and so if you're, if you're acquiring to be able to, to um, fulfill your contracts over that period, that's quite a long way, you know, your hope 10 years ago of, of what you might be able to realize from your acquisition. And now with the political and the economic uncertainty and pressures on government budgets and everything else, that suddenly looks a lot less certain than it did um, in previous years. So the fact yeah. that there is your, you've got an inherent weakness in the, in the balance sheet that is... Because they're locked in hope. prices from, uh, from... And again, very often on these, on these contracts, you tend to make the savings, the big savings come at the beginning of, of contracts, so you can do quite a lot of cutting and, and restructuring, reorganisation. Um, so you should be getting those profits quite early on. Um, and then over the course of the, um, of the contract, wages increase and exactly. you know, other things happen that perhaps that wasn't apparent when you, when you priced the, the contracts in the, in the first place. Okay, just, just to go, come back to uh, Carillion, uh, uh, again, this, of course, is the age core. You can see with, with uh, our overall uh, health of Carillion was okay until December 2016, then hit the floor in June 2017 when uh, they announced uh, substantial losses, and they fell in, as Joe mentioned, January, February 2018. This is uh, the, the first analysis of the financials of Carillion, and the line is the strength of the profits, and the bars is the strength of the balance sheet. So the blue is the strength of the asset side of the balance sheet, and always, of course, the higher the better, the lower the worse. And the green is the strength of the funding, how they pay for those assets. And you can see Carillion were weak throughout, had an exceptionally weak balance sheet throughout, and the only thing that was keeping Carillion out of the warning area was the strength of their profits. And any time you see a profile like this, we always call this sort of profile a water skier type of uh, profile because so long as the profit boat is pulling the skier along, everything's fine. As soon as the profit boat stops, there's nothing to fall back on. And clearly with a balance sheet like this, there really was nothing to fall back on. So if I just quickly jump to the financials, uh, um, you can see Carillion were making good profits until 2016. Of course, they had the disaster in, in June 2017. But if you look at the balance sheet, and this is what I wanted to get to, if you look at the intangible assets, the intangible, this is, and intangible assets are trademarks and they can be uh, uh, brand names, but invariably and predominantly it relates to goodwill, which as I mentioned is the excess of, uh, of the amount the companies pay to acquire another company. So if the book value is 10 million and they pay 100 million, 90 million becomes goodwill. And, and that only has the value of what the uh, you know, what the uh, what Carillion put to it mm -hmm. and paid for it. So they said in 2016 they were sitting with 1.7 almost 1.7 billion of intangibles, which is not worth anything. So if you net that off against the the net worth, if you say that has no value, basically you've got minus 900 million uh, uh, negative 900 million of net worth. In other words, your liabilities exceed your assets by 900 million. In that sense, technically, it, you're insolvent. Te technically insolvent, absolutely. Um, and of course, by, by June, they really were negative. But even on top of that, plus <laughs> yeah. on top of the 1.5, so it would be 1.92 uh, billion negative by the time June. But the balance sheet was the same all the way through. Bear in mind, yes, they were, made, they were generating 146 million of profits, but they had 2.2 billion of liabilities to pay in the next 12 months, which is current. Yeah. Okay. So that's Carillion. Have a look at Interserve, maybe. That's okay. the end. Interserve. So that's Interserve. We had Interserve looking not too bad till 2015, then fell sharply into our warning area, into our picture. So let's look at the strengths and weaknesses of, of Interserve. 
And again, you see a company with a weak balance sheet held up there purely because of the profits, and it's you know, it's not a very dissimilar story to, in fact, it's a very similar story to uh, Carillion. And I'll just jump to the financials. And there's uh, the profits. They were making profits to 15 and then started making losses. But if you look at the balance sheet all the way along, they had $427 million in 2017 of intangibles. They've been writing off the intangibles over the years. I think they realized it wasn't worth anything. They started writing it off. So 427 million of intangibles and net worth of 62 million. So you're landing up with, uh, you know, 370 million negative net worth. So liabilities exceeded your assets by 370 million, and uh, uh, of which 862 million had to be paid in the next 12 months. And I mean, that's revenue. impossible, isn't it? If you're not making well, the money, if you're not generating making your, losses, make 244 million is rather hard to pay yeah. 862 million. Okay, uh, so that's uh, uh, InterServe. Let's look at uh, one other, which is Mighty. That's actually next. Let's uh, have a long, I think. Uh, over there. Mighty, a very similar story to uh, uh, InterServe. I'm not, I, I bear in mind being in, in, in the warning area doesn't mean the company is going to fail. It simply says that it's displaying characteristics of companies that previously went on to fail. It doesn't mean they're going to fail. It means they are amongst the group that now could, could but potentially also, I mean, fail. Then I think it's about, um, that's when I think the, the credit management side really comes into its own because, because you know your, um, your customers better than we do. You know the relationships you've got with them, how key you are um, as a supplier. And I think we're, um, we're just, with, with this, we're able to, to allow you to kind of manage that risk um, much, much more, much more closely to kind of um, to be able to, to show where the, the, the critical um, risks are and those companies that might get blown off course. You know, if the, if the banks are they reliant on bank debts and the banks. Of course, I mean, you want to know that Carillion was, um, was vulnerable all the way along. You want to know that uh, Mighty is a little bit shaky. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if you look at the uh, strengths and weaknesses, it's a very familiar story. In fact, the balance sheet, if anything, is worse. It's closer to zero. Uh, it's hardly put its head up above uh, the, the water. And um, if you look at the um, financial data, uh, yes, there's been a, there's been a, they have managed to turn their losses, they've had two years of losses, into a, a small profit. But uh, again, a similar story with 347 million in the previous year, or in, in March 18, of intangibles. In fact, over here, it already was negative, uh, a, a negative net worth. And, uh, uh, There's still almost 600 million worth of liabilities to pay in a year off 90 million profit. I mean, that's that's, right. that's heroic if you can um, yes. if you can yes. do that. In, in the latest period, yes, uh, almost 600 million exactly. Yeah. Okay, um, not uh, uh, the one just before uh, two more. I was going to look at uh, that. Not everyone is weak uh, uh, in the, in the uh, outsourcing sector. Mm -hmm. Let me bring that up for you, Dennis. Um, the other one, which and this I suppose strictly is not um, is not a, a pure outsourcing um, uh, company, but, is it? But they're obviously a major player. Now this is Accenture. They're obviously an international company and and have fingers in many pies. But this is an exceptionally strong company. If you look at the strengths and weaknesses, you know, profits are spectacular. Balance sheet is good. If you look at the financial data of this company. You know, this is a three-month period, so uh, the profits look like they've come down, but it's a three-month period. Huge profits, fair enough. But if you look at the relationship in the balance sheet, this is a global layout, so slightly different layout. But you've got an intangible asset here of six billion, but yet you have net worth of thirteen billion. I mean, it's a completely different story, a completely different story. And they've got current liabilities of ten billion, but profits of five point eight billion. You know, on an annualized basis. And uh, they're very liquid. They're sitting with four billion of cash. I mean, this is a very strong company, you know. It's bit unfair. The last company I want to look at is, is uh, Capita. Let me just. Uh, I think it's there. Is it? Okay. So Capita. Um, and had they had a, a torrid time in the summer, didn't they? they yeah, they, well, they had a disaster time. I think at the end of 2017, when they had a. I think people were very concerned that they, they may have to go into a major reconstruction or something like that. Mm -hmm. In fact, what happened is they did go into a reconstruction. They had to raise, I think, 600 million of, of new capital, and they sold a division. 
And the result of the sale of the division uh, brought them up there, didn't quite bring them out of the warning area. If you look at the strengths and weaknesses again, again, same profile with a very, very weak bunch. And the one thing that's bringing them out is their profits. And they've just issued the, um, their 2018 results. We, just, we, are, we haven't, that hasn't yet been updated on our system. So if I did a, uh, a quick forecast on this company just to see where they are with the new, because they're showing good profits now. So quick forecast. I'll change to actual numbers. I think it's, they've made about, um, I think it's, I think it's 130. Uh, okay. Just to get this, uh, make it one three. It's, uh, it's well, that's uh, for a half year. So that's uh, so on an annual annualized basis, it's about 260. But if you look there, and let's see what they look like now. So yes, they would come out of the warning area. Uh, based purely on the profits, if you go to the balance sheet, um, the, uh, you can still see that the balance sheet remains weak. So They've again, got a lot of work to do. Really, yeah, they, they really need to boost their balance sheet. They're sitting with, if I go to their data, they're sitting with, uh, okay, they're sitting with significant, sorry, it's a slightly different layout, but they're sitting with significant intangible assets against net worth of, well, it's negative. So uh, um, uh, you can see the situation with uh, with, the, with this whole sector. So I think that's the um, I suppose that's a kind of whistle stop tour really through the um, through the, the, the this sector just as a as a as a case study um, really. I suppose if we're drawing a few um, conclusions, undoubtedly there's been a, a huge period of, of uncertainty. Um, but lots of companies will be able to weather the storm, and I, I think it would be wrong to, to say that we, we're, we're pessimistic about UK um, PLC. I think there are lots of companies out there that are strong and there fundamentally strong companies, will, be, will, will come through um, absolutely, absolutely fine. But the key thing is that they, because they've got the, the strong financial foundations, they are in control of their own destiny. You know, if, if new business um, doesn't materialise, if their, if their profits don't come through, they've actually got sufficient reserves to be able to, um, to, be able to see the, the, the period through. And really the problem is when those companies that are actually already very weak, um, they, those companies are going to find it much, much harder to operate, and they won't be in control of their, their own destiny. They'll be reliant on, on lenders, on finding new business, exposure to exchange rates, um, the, the ability of their, um, of their suppliers to extend the, the credit terms, and they'll have much less room for manoeuvre um, in, uh, under those circumstances. Um, really. I suppose the message I would like to get through is the financials are a powerful predictor or identifier of companies that are strong and weak. Everyone knows that strong companies don't fail. It's, uh, you know, and the weak ones are the ones that are vulnerable. Of course, you need to know how strong are the strong companies, which are, which are the strong companies, and that's where the financials really, really do come in to uh, identify and profile those companies which are strong and those which are weak. So thank you very much, everybody, for, um, for taking the time out of your, your lunch time today to, um, to listen to the, the webinar. We'd be very happy to take any, um, any, any questions you may have. I'll hand back to, to Becky um, to curate those for us. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, both Joe and Dennis. Very, very interesting facts there. So um, I'm just going to fire some questions that you guys have had coming through. The first one is, um, you mentioned that you found five, uh, sorry, seven ratios in particular to be predictive. What are they? Okay. So I'll go back yeah. into um, to where we were before. So if we we just get back into um, to here, do you want to use a capital? Or? Oh, yeah, that's fine, yeah. Well, they are all unusual because, uh, as Joe may, may have mentioned, we threw hundreds of ratios into the pot, and these seven came up as being overwhelmingly the most discriminating. And, and there weren't ratios that you know, we sat around the table and said, which are the best to use? These came out of the empirical research. So the, um, when we looked at the profit ratio, it wasn't profit divided by sales. It's actually what we found the most predictive was profits in relation to current liabilities. It's the ability of a company to generate profits in relation to the amount that it needs to pay in the next 12 months. So yeah, you can see uh, Capita were generating very good profits uh, against 1.4 billion of current liabilities. So that gets 72 out of 100, and that dropped to December 19, December 17, sorry, to nine out of 100. So always uh, the higher the better, the lower the worse. 
and that's the, the profit rate related ratio on the on the balance sheet on the asset side is liquidity stock and debtors and current assets liquidity is debt and cash which is obviously your your liquid uh, cash and, and receivables against your liabilities and against expenses okay so that's uh, always the green is the higher the better and the red is the lower the better and then you come to stock and debtors we found that many companies which failed failed with too much working capital in other words they weren't converting their stock into debt as quick enough and the debt is into cash quick enough. So too much working capital is bad news. And then the, the, the next one is current asset cover. Uh, uh, stock and debt has said too much working capital is bad news, but current asset cover says, well, you do need some to cover your liabilities. So the higher the current assets against your liabilities, the better. And then on the funding side, obviously the stronger the net worth, I hope that message came across, mm -hmm. the stronger the net worth, the better against your liabilities. Um, it says uh, the, current, the, the higher you're relying on current liabilities to fund your assets, the higher the risk. And lastly, the higher the dependency of a company on outside bank debt, the higher the risk. Those are the seven. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dennis. Thank you. Uh, the second question I have um, is, uh, what's your view on Debenhams? It's hardly at the newspapers, and just today Mark Ashley has made a formal bid for the company. What's your view on that, please, guys? Yeah, Mike, actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, Debenham is, is one that we, I think we need to call it up, do we? Yeah. So, it's down there, yeah, it's one that I was looked at before. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Uh, Debenhams. Debenhams is a company we've identified as weak for years, uh, and, and it's going to be look, look a rather uh, weak for ages and look at a rather familiar profile where the profits have held it up. But the balance sheet was so weak for this, uh, this financial structure that it brought the company into the warning area. And if you look at the financial data, it's, uh, again, huge intangible assets against uh, a net worth, which pretty much wiped out the net worth. And then it's sitting with $671 million and it needs to be paid in 12 months, and you, well, you, you're generating $59 million uh, uh, profits. So, we have identified this company as being vulnerable. Bear in mind in 2017, sorry, I think it's late 2016, they were worth a billion. By the end of 2017, they were worth 500 million, and they're now, well, they were worth 32 million, but Mike actually, I believe, is offering 60 million, isn't it? Yeah, I think 60. Yeah, so. Whether he'll take on the debt. Huh? Whether he'll want to take on all that debt. Yes. Uh, exactly. Well, I, I don't know what he's, he, he probably will, he probably want a, a, a clearance of yeah. that. But if you look at the equity profile, I mean, it's been quite a sad story uh, down to the very bottom. So here it says the market cap is 35 million, so he's giving it 25 million premium. But you're talking about a, a very different story to when it was worth a billion. Okay, anything else? Uh, no, that's it, thank you. Uh, that's all the questions we have at the moment. Uh, thank you very much, both of you. I'm just going to flip over to your contact details screen. So if anybody does have any questions, there we go. If anybody has any questions for Joe or Dennis following this presentation, then please feel free to contact them on the contact, via the contact details that are now showing on your screen. Um, also, please feel free to visit our website, CICM.com, where you'll find a recording of this webinar along with our other regional event and future webinars. So once again, thank you very much for Joe and Dennis to, uh, for joining us today. Thank you. And thank you to everybody for joining us today and listening. Like I say, if you have any questions, please file them over. And uh, I hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you.